Thank you uh, very much. Uh, we'll get to the uh, announcements very quickly. Uh, I do want to recognize Paul Tash and thank him as a dear friend uh, for his service on the board. It's always sad uh, when people leave uh, the board, and uh, Paul especially, just fantastic editor, careful, great sense of humor, uh, really fun to be with and important. Daniel Allen, to be the new chair, brings an academic uh, perspective into this and an incredible reader and thinker, and it's a thrill to have her as the new chair. And of course, Sig Gissler, uh, who has, I would say, brought youth and progressive thinking to the Pulitzers all through this. And you know, there's nothing, I think, more difficult than composing these juries and bringing issues to the board and trying to bring everything to this point. And Sig has done that uh, masterfully. Um, it does seem to me, I mean, just one editorial comment, I suppose, <clears throat> that it is important to sort of mark this occasion uh, when two of the great um, uh, publications uh, in the United States and in the world, the Post and the Guardian U.S., will receive the Pulitzer Prize. Important to just observe uh, that we've lived since the 1970s with Pentagon Papers and the kind of crazy system that's set up under the First Amendment uh, where the government is given total impunity to operate in secrecy and classify and overclassify, and there's absolutely no right under the Constitution on the part of the press uh, or anyone to insist that the government turn over important uh, documents or information for the public interest. Leakers, <clears throat> leakers are completely exposed. I mean, if they decide the public really needs to know this, uh, they're, I'm afraid, extremely vulnerable to prosecution. And if they say that it's important for the public to have this and the First Amendment uh, should protect that, the answer thus far has been, uh, I'm sorry, but that's not the case. Uh, it is uh, significant, however, that leakers are rarely uh, identified and when identified, rarely prosecuted. But to be in a situation where it's rare to be prosecuted for something you've done is itself uh, fairly inhibiting. And then the press, uh, journalists, editors can receive this information, take stolen property, know that it's been stolen, and cannot be stopped from publishing it, and uh, prior restraints, injunctions, really not allowed except under very, very rare circumstances. On the other hand, there's this lacuna in the First Amendment that says maybe they can be prosecuted after the fact for publishing it. And of course, it's uh, not a very great freedom uh, to be able to publish something without an injunction uh, when you're going to end up in an orange suit afterwards for having published it. So there's an ambiguity there that has never been resolved, and of course it's customary for the U.S. government not to prosecute the press. In this absolutely unruly, messy world, which has been described as kind of a war between the press and the government, uh, it seems to have worked fairly well. And government has been able to operate and, and uh, effectively and the public has been able to get a lot of very important information. It's a big, big open question whether, A, that is a system that will continue into the future. Have the facts changed? Is it a different world? Uh, Julian Assange is not Ben Bradley. Uh, and uh, it's a lot easier now to take government information in the click of a button and hand it over. Uh, that's not to say it should be different. Uh, I think it shouldn't, but it's an open question that will have to be uh, faced in this generation. Uh, and of course now uh, it's an issue for the broader world. And it's just, I think, important uh, today in this somewhat historical moment uh, that we recognize a fairly recent system that was constructed uh, basically in the 19, late 1960s and 70s and has remained with us uh, to this day, but is an open question uh, for the future. And lastly, let me just say, 
it's an enormous privilege uh, for me personally. I think every member of the board of the Pulitzer Prize feels this way to participate in the process. I've never been part of, of any decision making uh, that has more integrity to it than, than this. So all of you who have and will receive awards today can take great pride in the fact that this is a, this is a process worthy of the prize uh, that you will get. Shall we begin? Um, we start with public service. For a distinguished example of meritorious public service by a newspaper or news site through the use of its journalistic resources, including the use of stories, editorials, cartoons, photographs, graphics, videos, databases, multimedia, or interactive presentations, or other visual material, a gold medal, and of course there are two awardees. The first, the Guardian US for its revelation of widespread secret surveillance by the National Security Agency, helping through aggressive reporting to spark a debate about the relationship between the government and the public over issues of security and privacy. Janine Gibson and Alan Rusbridger, please come forward to accept the prize. The second prize goes to the Washington Post for its revelation of widespread secret surveillance by the National Security Agency, marked by authoritative and insightful reports that help the public understand how the disclosures fit into the larger framework of national security. Martin Barron and Bart Gelman, please come forward. Breaking news. For a distinguished example of local reporting of breaking news that, as quickly as possible, captures events accurately as they occur, and as time passes, illuminates, provides context, and expands upon the initial coverage. The Boston Globe staff, for its exhaustive and empathetic coverage of the Boston Marathon bombings and the ensuing manhunt, that enveloped the city using photography and a range of digital tools to capture the full impact of the tragedy. Christine Chinlin, Jennifer Peter, and Mike Bellow will accept the prize today. Please come forward. Investigative reporting. For a distinguished example of investigative reporting using any available journalistic tool, Chris Hamby of the Center for Public Integrity, Washington, DC, for his reports on how some lawyers and doctors rigged a system to deny benefits to coal miners stricken with black lung disease, 
resulting in remedial legislative efforts. Congratulations, Chris Hamby. Explanatory reporting for a distinguished example of explanatory reporting that illuminates a significant and complex subject, demonstrating mastery of the subject, lucid writing, and clear presentation using any available journalistic tool. Eli Saslow of the Washington Post for his unsettling and nuanced reporting on the prevalence of food stamps in post-recession America forcing readers to grapple with the issues of poverty and dependency. Congratulations, Eli Sassler. Local reporting. For a distinguished example of reporting on significant issues of local concern, demonstrating originality and community expertise using any available journalistic tool, Will Hobson and Michael LaForgia of the Tampa Bay Times for their relentless investigation into the squalid conditions that marked housing for the city's substantial homeless population, leading to swift reforms. Congratulations, Will Hobson and Michael LaForge. This is your boy. Is this the guy with the beard? I don't see a guy with a beard. That's a small beard. Yeah. Hi. National reporting for a distinguished example of reporting on, a nas on national affairs using any available journalistic tool. David Phillips of the Gazette, Colorado Springs, Colorado, for expanding the examination of how wounded combat veterans are mistreated, focusing on loss of benefits for life after discharge by the Army for minor offenses. Stories augmented with digital tools and stirring congressional action. Congratulations, David Phillips. international reporting. For a distinguished example of reporting on international affairs using any available journalistic tool, Jason Zepp and Andrew R.C. Marshall of Reuters for their courageous reports on the violent persecution of the Rohingya, a Muslim minority in Myanmar, that in efforts to flee the country often fall victim to predatory human trafficking networks Congratulations, Jason Zepp and Andrew R.C. Marshall. Marshall is the ball of Which one is Marshall?
commentary, for a distinguished commentary using any available journalistic tool, Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press for his columns on the financial crisis facing his hometown, written with passion and a stirring sense of place, sparing no one in their critique. Congratulations, Stephen Henderson. Distinguished criticism, for distinguished criticism using any available journalistic tool, Inga Saffron of the Philadelphia Inquirer, for her criticism of architecture that blends expertise, civic passion, and sheer readability into arguments that consistently stimulate and surprise. Congratulations, Inga Saffron. Editorial writing. For distinguished editorial writing, the test of excellence being clearness of style, moral purpose, sound reasoning, and power to influence public opinion in what the writer conceives to be the right direction using any available journalistic tool. The editorial staff of the Oregonian Portland for its lucid editorials that explain the urgent but complex issue of rising pension costs, notably engaging readers and driving home the link between necessary solutions and their impact on everyday lives. Eric Lukens, Susan Nielsen, Len Reed, and Mark Hester will accept the prize. Congratulations. <laughs> Editorial cartooning. For a distinguished cartoon or portfolio of cartoons characterized by originality, editorial effectiveness, quality of drawing, and pictorial effect, published as a still drawing, animation, or both. Kevin Sires of the Charlotte Observer for his thought-provoking cartoons drawn with a sharp wit and bold artistic style. Congratulations, Kevin Sires. <clears throat> Breaking news photography. For a distinguished example of breaking news photography in black and white or color, which may consist of a photograph or photographs, Tyler Hicks of the New York Times, for his compelling pictures that showed skill and bravery in documenting the unfolding terrorist attack at Westgate Mall in Kenya. Congratulations, Tyler Hicks. Yeah. 
feature photography. For a distinguished example of feature photography in black and white or color, which may consist of a photograph or photographs, Josh Hanner of the New York Times for his moving essay on a Boston Marathon bomb blast victim who lost most of both legs and now is painfully rebuilding his life. Congratulations, Josh Hanner. Pulitzer Prize in Fiction for Distinguished Fiction by an American author, preferably dealing with American life. The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, a beautifully written coming of age novel with exquisitely drawn characters that follows a grieving boy's entanglement with a small famous painting that has eluded destruction a book that stimulates the mind and touches the heart. Congratulations, Donna Tart. Drama for a distinguished play by an American author, preferably original in its source and dealing with American life. The Flick by Annie Baker, a thoughtful drama with well-crafted characters that focuses on three employees of a Massachusetts art house movie theater, rendering lives rarely seen on the stage. Congratulations, Annie Baker. History for a distinguished and appropriately documented book on the history of the United States. The Internal Enemy, Slavery and War in Virginia, 1772 to 1832 by Alan Taylor, a meticulous and insightful account of why runaway slaves in the colonial era were drawn to the British side as potential liberators. Congratulations, Alan Taylor. biography for a distinguished and appropriately documented biography or autobiography by an American author. Margaret Fuller, A New American Life by Megan Marshall, a richly researched book that tells the remarkable story of a 19th century author, journalist, critic, and pioneering advocate of women's rights who died in a shipwreck. Congratulations, Megan Marshall.
and poetry for a distinguished volume of original verse by an American author, three sections by Vijay Shishadri, a compelling collection of poems that examine human consciousness from birth to dementia in a voice that is by turns witty and grave, compassionate and remorseless. Congratulations, Vijay Shishastri. Nonfiction for a distinguished and appropriately documented book of nonfiction by an American author that is not eligible for consideration in any other category. Tom's Rivers, River, a, a story of science and salvation by Dan Fagan, a book that deftly combines investigative reporting and historical research to probe a New Jersey seashore's town's cluster of childhood cancers linked to water and air pollution. Congratulations, Dan Fagan. And the last prize is in music for distinguished musical composition by an American that has had its first performance or recording in the United States during the year. Become Ocean by John Luther Adams, premiered on June 20th, 2013 by the Seattle Symphony. A haunting orchestral work that suggests a relentless tidal surge evoking thoughts of melting polar ice and rising sea levels. Congratulations, John Luther Adams. So that's in honor to the Columbia baseball team that has won the second Ivy League championship in a row, two years in a row. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all of the winners. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed teaming up with Lee uh, in uh, the enterprise of sprinkling fairy dust on all these winners. It's been a, a great privilege and a great honor. And uh, our luncheon is now complete. I urge you to check our website. In the days ahead, we'll have a slideshow and other material from the uh, luncheon. And uh, we will now have all the winners assemble out on the front steps for kind of a graduation picture. Uh, thank you very much for coming. It's been a grand day.